Welcome to Through the Bible. Today we continue our study of Ecclesiastes, a book Dr. J. Vernon McGee calls Remarkable. And I agree. As you open to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 15, here's an introduction. Our study today brings us to Ecclesiastes, the first chapter at verse 15. That's where we're going to begin. We hope you have notes and outlines and that you will be following the study with the notes and outlines and a Bible open to this place. You'll find all of this will make this more interesting, more understandable, because we have come to a remarkable book. It's God's answer to modern-day humanism that has saturated our society today. And in this particular section we're coming to today, Solomon is going to exhaust the subject of education and show that that does not satisfy. The getting of knowledge is a weariness to the flesh, he says. And then he turns to pleasure. He had access to all the pleasures of the world. He was the richest man in the world. He could buy anything he wanted. And he was king, and he certainly had the authority to do it. So this man exhausted the things of this world and found out that they did not satisfy at all. And humanism today, of course, uses that method. Now, you will find them working in the field of education today. Education is built on this. And as a result, morality is never taught because each individual is to do what he thinks is best. And what he thinks is right is right. What he thinks is wrong is wrong. Now, God is the one that has set the standard, by the way, And believe me, he has drawn the line, and you have to draw the line between right and wrong. Mason, you remember, said to Dixon, he says, you've got to draw the line somewhere. Well, there has to be a line drawn about morality. And as a result, why today we see that even our schools have become the center of crime, immorality, and drugs. And I have two letters here that were sent me by listeners. The letters were not addressed to me, but to the listener, but they passed it on to me. This is a letter sent out from the office of the senior assistant attorney general in Sacramento, California. And he says, I have just received a very disturbing report on crime in California, and the situation is extremely grave. If there was any room for doubt before, it's gone now. Violent crime is completely out of control in California. Now, my friend, this is the result of humanism. This is the result of a departure from uh, biblical morality. And this is the way that we're moving today. Now, Solomon dealt with that, and also he dealt with this subject of pleasure. Great many people think that to become a Christian means that you are to just have a good time, you know. One group is taking a trip on the love boat. One Christian group's going to do that. And Christian conferences today have become just big time for fun, you see. Well, let me read this letter to you that is just an excerpt. And I do want to say to you that when I read it, it looked me straight in the eyes and asked me a question. And I'll be honest with you, I'm afraid I'd have to fudge on the answer. Will you listen to this? If you knew that giving out a gospel of John or a salvation tract would send you to jail for up to five years, how many would you give out? May I say to you, I do not think I'd be given out tracts. I don't do much of that anyway, but my, you see what is said here? These are questions, you see, we don't face today. We like conferences where we're going to be able to make our marriage and our home a heaven here on earth, and we are just going to have a high old good time. You know, that's the thing that we are after, after all. And 
Certainly Christianity ought to do that for us. Jesus wouldn't want us to be unhappy, would he? Well, of course he would, my friend, especially if there's sin in your life. And he could weep over Jerusalem, and there's no one weeping over it today. That is, Christians today are trying to get as far away from problems and troubles that they can. That was a good question, and by the way, the whole letter was a good letter, but that's all that I'm going to read. Now, Solomon is going to say that pleasure is not really the answer to life down here at all. And I think that we need to recognize that and that you and I today need to recognize that we are in this world for a very serious purpose. And it's not just to have a good time. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not to have things that bring joy to your heart. In fact, a child of God should have joy in his heart all the time. We saw that when we were in the book of Philippians. And now we are here in a book that's looking us right straight in the eye and telling us that pleasure is not the route that a Christian can go or the man of God can go. And so, friends, we're coming now to our study of this most unusual book, and I hope that you and I will be able to get the message of it and find out that the things of this world actually do not satisfy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to find wisdom in Solomon's words and then know the joy and satisfaction that can only be found through our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're off to Ecclesiastes 1 on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now today, friends, we come back to verse 15 in the first chapter of Ecclesiastes. Now, this man Solomon is making a tremendous experiment. He's making it in the laboratory of life. And he is trying out everything that's available to man. And in his day, he was able to go into any field that he wanted to go into. And not many men even today would be permitted to do what Solomon was able to do. And he attempted, first of all, to give himself to a study of the laws of nature. But he found out that even there, There was nothing that you could learn in nature, nothing in science that would be new to you in the sense that it would bring new life to you. Only the new birth could possibly do that, and that was the only new thing. Then here in verse 15 where we've come, we're in the section where he tries out philosophy. That is, he tries out man's own planning and man's own scheming to see how he can work out the problems of life and come to some happy solution. Now, today, philosophy leads generally to a pessimistic viewpoint of life. That is the thing that generally happens. Now, verse 15 says this, That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. Now, you cannot take a natural man, a man that is a lost sinner, alienated from God, and give him an education and expect that education to solve the problems of life. It will not do that. Philosophy and psychology cannot change human nature, nor can they even correct the old nature of man, because here we are told that which is crooked cannot be made straight. Man hasn't any way of straightening out human nature. We have an old bromide that goes like this. As the twig is bent, so the tree grows. That's the way that it will grow. It'll be crooked because the twig was crooked. And you and I start out with an old nature, and you can educate it, and you can do many things with it and to it. But the Lord Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. It'll always be flesh, friends. And that's the reason man must have a new nature, because that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. 
That's one of the greatest principles that there is. And today we have seen that education will not solve the problems of life. Now with the things that have happened in the past few years, higher education, in fact all education, is coming under the scrutiny of a great many thoughtful people. And there are others that have tried to come up with a solution. The committee to study the higher education today has come up with this very novel explanation. They say that the riots on campuses and all of this immorality that's taken place is because of the fact that the young people today are inquiring more and they are more interested in politics and in what is happening in their world. Well, I would say that that's true, that there is an interest today because of so many terrible things happening and because of the news media through television and radio and paper today really gathers it from the four corners of the earth in a day and lets you see it and hear it in that evening so that we're more aware at what takes place in the world today than we ever were before. There was a time when it would be six weeks before they'd find out who really was elected president after an election. It took that long to get all the information in. Today they can tell you who's going to be elected before they have the election. That's a novel way of going at it, but that's what they do today. So that we've come a long way, and I would concur with the first part of it. But I disagree heartily with the last part of it, which says that is the reason that young people have been led to rioting and this type of thing, because that it's not a deterioration on the campus, but actually improvement. Well, we have come to the day that Isaiah said they're going to call good evil and evil good, and they do that today. May I say to you, That's a novel way that only an educated man could come up with, is to say that the deterioration on the campus today is not deterioration, but actually improvement. Now, if you believe fairy stories, you can go along with that. But my friend, may I say to you, education cannot solve the problems of life. And as I've said many times on this broadcast, and I continue to repeat it, and will continue to repeat it, is this, that psychology is not the answer today. Now, there have been a group of very clever men and women, I think, too, that have come up with some little psychological cliché to explain and solve the problems of life, and it's just covered over with a little Bible. It's just like, you know, a pill, a bitter pill that's covered over with a little sugar. Well, may I say to you that all of this pretends to be the Bible's solution. Well, it's not the Bible's solution. Actually, the Word of God contains for the Christian today the answer to the problems of life. And it doesn't come about through some little pious and sugar-coated Bible pill that is given out and it has psychological and philosophical implications That's not the solution. Some men are doing pretty well financially themselves with it. But I want to tell you, the Christian public is really being taken in. And I say this kindly to you. Why don't you get back to the Bible? Why don't you come to it today? There's no easy solution to the problems of life. And studying the Word of God requires a great deal of, I would say, mental perspiration and it's needed today, and it's needed today in the church. So that Solomon found out that philosophy and education and psychology did not have the answer to the problems of life. Now, will you notice what he says in verse 16? He says, I communed with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate. And I've gotten more wisdom than all they that had been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. Now, this man was led to a certain amount of, I think, arrogance, a certain amount of conceit, since he was wiser than the others. 
And knowledge, as Paul says, puffeth up. It always inflates an individual like a balloon if he feels like he's a little smarter or better educated than those that are around him. But again, education has to fall back on experience, and experience is something you cannot trust. It has to be tested by the Word of God. The thing today is that a great many people are testing the Word of God by their experience. My friend, you need to test your experience by the Word of God and see if it will stand up and under it. Now, will you notice verse 17? He says, And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. And the very interesting thing is that wisdom and Playing the fool are not very far apart. How many smart men in the history of the world have played the fool? Solomon did. He's one of the most notable examples of that. The man that we call it the King James Bible, he, of course, he actually had nothing to do with the translation of it in doing any translating. He never would have been capable. You know why? He was called James the Fool. And the reason he was called that, because that's what he was. But he thought he was a very smart individual. Verse 18, For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Now, joy and satisfaction do not increase in ratio to the increase of knowledge. Someone has said that when ignorance is bliss, it's folly to be wise. And there's a certain amount of truth in that. In much wisdom, there's much grief. The more we know, the more we increase our problems. And life today has become tedious, and it produces tension, and all of these scientific gadgets that we have around us are making life almost unbearable. A man said to me just the other day, and he's a Christian, by the way, he said, you know, I think I'm going to lose my mind if I don't get away from these computers, these machines that have become our masters and that are controlling life today. They produce the air we breathe, which is smog in our place, and they are the ones that are producing most of the work that's around us, and we think how wonderful a machine is, and we fall down and worship before it. But he says it's driving us to madness today. How true, for in much wisdom is much grief. And you must remember, Solomon did not live in the machine age. He did not see the industrial revolution, but he certainly knew what he was talking about. Now we come to chapter 2, and we see him now following another course to find satisfaction in life. And this is the route that a great many are taking today, seeking satisfaction and pleasure. And in the next 11 verses here in chapter 2, why he goes into that. Listen to him. He says, I said in mine heart, go to now, therefore enjoy pleasure. And behold, this is also vanity. Now, this man, Solomon, I think he probably tried everything that is known today in the way of pleasure. Now, we are sex-crazed and a sex-mad people. And what do we have to show for it? Well, we have certainly low morals, and we have venereal disease that's in epidemic stage today. Now, Solomon was rather an expert in this area of sex. And today the church has gone in this direction, and I suppose most pastors have a sermon on sex. Some of them have a whole series, and there are many today that feel like that we should have a course in the church to teach our young people about sex. May I say I'm very much of a square. I think that's a big and tragic mistake. That's my idea. This generation is getting sex right up to here, and I'm now putting my hand up to my ears. We are getting all of it that I think we need. But in spite of all of that, may I say to you, I submit to you that Solomon was the expert in this area. He had a thousand wives. 
Now, not all of them were wives. A great many of them were what would be called concubines, but they were all available to him. And a man that's got a thousand of those around is some sort of an expert, my friend. And Solomon tried that field. He went in for drinking. He went in for entertainment. He had the outstanding nightclub of the country in his day. He could have put on a performance that would make Las Vegas look like it was Penny Annie and that it was a sideshow in a small circus. But this is the thing this man tried, pleasure. Now, will you listen to him in his experience? He said, I said in my heart, go to now. I'll prove thee with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure. And behold, this also is vanity. And the word vanity, as we've said before, means empty. And he said, I said of laughter, it's mad and of mirth. What doeth it? He said, I have had a fool at court that entertained me, told me the latest jokes, and many of them, I suppose, that were questionable. And he said that I found out that this was a great waste of time. He said, I sought mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom and to lay hold on folly till I might see what was that good for the sons of man, which they should do under the heaven, that is, under the sun, all the days of their life. Now, this is a man probing at life, making experiments apart from God. Now, he said here that I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. These were all hobbies with Solomon, of course. You can go to that land today. You can see his stables, ruins of them in several places, right in Jerusalem. There are the ruins, and up at Megiddo, the thing that they will show you, the ruins of the troughs there, apparently where the horses ate. Solomon had stables all over that land, and he was forbidden. That is, the Mosaic law forbade the king to do that. Then he said, I made me pools of water. Now, he had a swimming pool. The water there with the wood that bringeth forth trees. He had irrigation. I got me servants and maidens. I had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. He had him a ranch out at the edge of town where he raised this. Somebody says, how could he afford all of this? Well, Solomon cornered the gold in his day. He had plenty of spending money, and he went in for entertainment, and he built him all of the comforts of life. They know today that they brought down from Mount Hermon snow so that he could have cold drinks in summertime. And now Solomon, I think, tried everything that a man today could try for pleasure. I don't think there could be any exception to this whatsoever. And it just didn't seem to work out. Listen to him. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers. He brought in the best nightclub acts from Las Vegas. They didn't really satisfy him. And the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. He said, I had all kinds of music the sweet music, the rock music, I had it all, but it didn't satisfy. So I was great, and I increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor." Ms. McGee and I are out a great deal in conferences, and one of the things we like to do some evenings to get away from everyone after a service, we just walk through a shopping area. And I have said to her, would you like some time to be able to buy everything that you see and want? She said she wondered how it would feel to do that. Well, Solomon did that. Anything that his little heart wanted, why, he bought. And as he looked out upon this world, there's nothing that it withheld from him. Now the question is, would this bring satisfaction? Would it bring joy to his heart? 
I think you already know the answer, but we're going to see that next time and the reason for it as we continue to move on through this book. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. We'll see you next time as we make our way through the Bible. Until then, you can reach us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or ttb.org. grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, whom God uses to take the whole word to the whole world.